Hi there, I'm Teresa Anda, and welcome to the Ghana Conversations, a CDD Ghana podcast. This podcast is an engagement platform that fosters a healthy, progressive discourse on real issues, engaging the minds of Ghanaians and dominating both online and offline conversations. Each episode brings you insightful perspectives, as well as actionable tips and strategies on how to address key issues affecting the Ghanaian citizen. I have seen young people who said, hey, bring the military. I said, you are a kid. You don't know what that means. Something is that if we do more, it probably will work. And it's a shame that across the continent, we have reduced the so-called social contract to a four-year activity. In this episode of Ghana Conversations, we will listen to various views on democracy with the theme, Making Democracy Work for the People. Our panel members are Professor Kwesi Prempe, the Executive Director of CDD Ghana, Kina Likimani, the Director of Special Programs at Odekro, Dr. Lloyd Amwa, the Director of the Center for Asian Studies at the University of Ghana, and Mamed Dakwa Awenado, an international trade law expert, writer, and African continental free trade area advocate. This two-part conversation was sourced from CDD Ghana's 2019 roundtable discussion for democracy. Sit back, relax, and enjoy the first part of this enlightening conversation. The topic, uh, making democracy work for Ghana, I'll tweak it just slightly, uh, making Ghana's democracy work for the people. Of course, Kojo made reference to the fact that Ghana's democracy is situated in a global story of democracy, and uh, we, we, we believe that. So the health of democracy globally is something, of course, that we're interested in. And of course, we know that democracy is not in its most healthy state or healthy, healthiest of states at the present time. Uh, globally, democracy is going through all kinds of convulsions. So uh, we take note of that, but we are focused on Ghana's democracy and how it is that it might work for the people. Now, saying Ghana's, making Ghana's democracy work for the people, I think, presupposes uh, a few things. One, that, that is what democracies do, that democracies work for the people or must work for the people, one. Two, that Ghana's democracy is not delivering on that expectation, that it is not working for the people or not working as well for the people, second. And thirdly, that it can be made better, that, it can, uh, that we can make it work for the people. Um, as to the first uh, presupposition, that working for the people is what democracies do, I think we can take, um, we, 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 some of us can take that for granted, not all, all, all of us do, but um, I, I'm, I'm sure Lloyd doesn't take it for granted. He, he just, I, he was laughing when I said that. <laughs> but, um, so if we just take the very um, street definition of democracy uh, given us by Abraham Lincoln, uh, a government of the people, by the people, for the people, uh, it does create the expectation. It, it, it embedded in that definition is the idea of democracy as being for the people, right? But even if we did not take it from that simplistic uh, definition, um, and then we looked at democracy as representative government, government based on the consent of the governed, a system of government in which the governed choose, right, have a voice and a vote in the choice of those who govern them. That definition also, I think, if we define it that way, you would also see that there's a connection between the governed and the governors. The idea of the governed choosing their own governors presupposes that they would choose those who govern them, who are interested in providing for the people. And in our democracy in Ghana, we do that through parties. So political parties are also supposed to be these vehicles that aggregates interests and preferences within the population. But we, we all don't like the same things, we all don't think the same way. So we have parties who go around mobilizing uh, citizen preferences, aggregating them into parties, and then uh, representing them in, in, the, in the corridors of power. 
So that's how, and so we think that because parties are supposed to do this kind of job, that our interests and preferences would be aggregated, and then when we compete for elections, the one that wins at least will, will reflect those interests and preferences in, in the governance of the state. Then there are other things about democracy that makes us think that it must work for the people. Um, the second thing is that it gives us voice. In a democracy, the citizens have the freedom of speech. It's one of the prerequisites of a democracy. And also, we have the vote. So the expectation is that when you combine all these things with frequent or periodic elections, which are competitive, that the outcome of it would be a government that meets the people's interest. So I think there are reasons why we expect that democracies would work for the people. The second uh, uh, the second assumption embedded in the question or in the framing of the topic is that it may not be working for the people, right? Um, Kojo mentioned a few, uh, a few data points that we have from Afrobarometer, which we've been doing uh, since the early 2000s. And we know from Afrobarometer data that democracy, support for democracy is quite strong. Uh, strong in Ghana, it's, it's been strong consistently, even though it's, it's showing some slight decline. But when you put all of the other alternatives to democracy, the Ghanaians overwhelmingly still choose democracy. Right? Uh, it may well be because we've had a taste of almost all of the other forms before. We've had one-party states, we've had military regimes, and Ghanaians have come to a certain conclusion that, uh, for better or worse, they like democracy. What we also see from the data is that while Ghanaians, like other Africans, overwhelmingly like democracy, they do not think that they are getting the supply of democracy that they want from the political class is adequate. In other words, they are not getting certain things delivered, certain goods delivered. And we can support what we see in the data with our own impressions. So impressionistically, if you look around, you would see that, in fact, there is a lot of grievance and resentment. Um, you, can, you can measure it on, you know, through social media conversation, but you can also see it on the streets. Um, and also, inequality has been growing along with our democracy, inequality, special inequality, gender, and in many other respects. So there are a number of, of, of reasons uh, for us to, to think that it is indeed true that large sections of the population do not feel well served by democracy, certainly in the, not in, the, in, in, in terms of political goods. We have a lot of political goods that come with democracy. People love to vote. People love the voice. They want to call in on radio. They have those freedoms. But I think along with that expectation when we transition to democracy was also the expectation that it would come with some material goodies. Now, those who are strong apostles of democracy will argue that we should separate the material goodies from just the inherent benefits of democracy. Uh, we don't want to debate that argument. There are those who think that democracy is inherently good, whether it supplies material goods or not. But what matters to us is that, whether that is true or not, the population, the people of Ghana, people uh, who uh, voted uh, to transition from military regime to democracy, those who approved the constitution, along with the expectation also came this idea that their lives would be better. Right? So whether or not the theorists believe that democracy is about doing that, at least the people also, uh, the, the people do believe that democracy must deliver some material benefits. It must provide them health, education, housing, and all of that. It doesn't mean that government, or it doesn't mean government must do all of that, but at least democracy must provide us a frame within which we can get these things. So that is the basis for us believing that um, making, making democracy work presupposes also that it is not working well. And the third is, of course, the purpose of this conversation, largely, I think, which is, can we make it work better? And um, I, I would frame that, essentially, the way I frame that is, what are the things about democracy that we rely upon to make democracy work? Uh, the building blocks of democracy, I have mentioned them. You have a right to voice, a, a right to articulate your interests and your preferences. You have the right to vote. Uh, that vote comes with a choice of parties. Are uh, the parties serving our interests? So if democracy is not working for the people, then we must look at our voice. Is our voice being heard? 
who is setting the agenda. We must look at our vote. Are we exercising the vote in a manner that would make the political class responsive to our needs? Parties. Are our parties organized in a way that are actually channeling our interests and preferences and aggregating them properly and reflecting them? So these are three, three, three of the key building block things. Elections. Are our elections uh, free, fair, sufficiently reflective of our preferences? What is it about election that's not working? Right? So for me, that's how I look at it. I look at these. And as citizens, are we also, are we also um, using the opportunity of democracy appropriately to make sure that the governance reflects our interests and preferences as the governed? So that's how I frame it. I, 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 would, I would like us in this conversation to be able to touch on these aspects of the democracy question. But of course, I think we should feel free, as I, I'm sure uh, my friend Lloyd would, uh, in actually going to the very first question, whether or not the assumption that democracy is there to work for the people is even correct. Thank you for the opportunity um, to participate on the panel. Um, the question was the assumption whether okay so first of all what is the work we always you know um we always so clear it's democracy and then we are never clear on what is the work so i go beyond democracy much higher and say we are about freedom and justice because we have the greatest coat of arms in the world and that's what ghana should always have aspired to democracy therefore is in my opinion the closest governance tool that can possibly get you to freedom and justice. It is not a foregone conclusion that democracy will get you to freedom and justice. Therefore, it's not a foregone conclusion. It's a tool. You have to tool it to work. When he, you know, I always cringe when people quote, you know, these American whatever. Because while they are busy saying all those things, there is a sizable population in their country that is not free. So democracy that is not, it's not a thing that is, is just automatically going to get you to freedom and justice. And, the, and, and you know, so me, I also don't talk about development because, you know, Ghanaians think development is, you know, the highest thing we should, attain, we should aspire to. It should be freedom and justice. So it's not automatic that you're going to have democracy and it is going to get you to X, Y, and Z. It just so happens to be the, gov the closest, the governance tool that possibly can get you there faster than any of the others. But if you just um, unleash democracy and you don't tool it, you're not going to get freedom and justice. So has it delivered freedom and justice? Of course life? not. Do you feel free? <laughs> <laughs> no. In fact, we are, in the, we are in an inequality gap explosion in Ghana because it also happens that you can have development and people will not be free. So no, I mean, just even looking at um, the crisis of wages and work in Ghana, has democracy de 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 delivered freedom and justice? You, you seem to have an economic definition for freedom. Do you not have an economic definition of freedom? I don't What's know. the point of economy if it's not going to make us free? Why am I in Ghana if it's not going to make me free? That's an interesting point. Ah. Um, um, mommy, <laughs> where, do you, where do you stand on that? Um, I would say that I don't think we've ever experienced um, democracy as it's defined. You know that the Greek word for democracy, the etymology, is um, demos, krastos, and it means um, common people, and then uh, that's demos, and then krastos is strength. And so if you think about it, it's really supposed to be underpinned by the strength of the people. But if you look at how it was institutionalized in Africa in the uh, early 90s, it was really at the, with the intention to... Um, I mean, give us aid or funding because we had incurred debt. If you know, I don't want to go too deep, but if you know that in the late 1970s, the U.S. had um, decided to um, increase the value of the dollar and um, the Reserve Bank and have affected um, some of the loans that we had already taken because after independence, we didn't have money. So we had to borrow money to develop. And imagine with that, um, incre the increase in interest rates. So who steps in? The World Bank and IMF to save us in the early 80s, right? But then when they saw how they failed with the institutionalization of certain um, systems to help us to develop economically, they stepped in the 90s with the whole idea of democratization as we know it today. And it's supposed to be the institutionalization of freedom of all the things that you're asking for. But the big question is that it seemingly has that, it's supposed to be doing that. But on the ground, what is it actually doing? It is facilitating the concept of increasing the power of the elite. 
because democracy as we know it is about really exercising your franchise, right? Go and vote. But the question is that who, gets, who do you get to vote for? And what is the option on the table for you, right? Because the people who get to um, stand for the party are the people who have what? Money. And so at the end of the day, you're talking about the common people and then the people who actually go and represent you are the people who have what? The money. And so it's the money that really talks and you see how much we spend on elections yearly. This is a, this is a money-making system. Uh, it, is, it has nothing to do with freedom. It has nothing to do with justice. And so that's how I want to just chip in and so I'll leave it with you. I see. I see. There's a lot of approval for that. <laughs> Lloyd. So the idea of democracy, the definition of the word, is what strength of what? The common people. But now, if we think about it, it's become the idea of, we have the idea of, a, of institutions that represent the common people. Parliament. Yeah, parliament. It looks so nice on the outside. The semblance of a strong state. You vote. You are independent. Your president rides in a nice car. You, you can read. You have all of these nice buildings. And then they tell you that that is freedom. But you are hungry. And your children don't have access to good education. And then you say that you are democratic. And every four years, yes, we are free. We are voting. What are you voting for? But that's pretty much the story of all the democracies I know of in the world right now, right? And uh, well, that was the essence. The essence was so to increase the power of the elite. Ghana, right? yes. It's so unique to Ghana. And so that's the, basically what has been happening. And we saw it happen in Libya recently with the idea that democracy was going to fix things in Libya. And look at what's happening. It's like a slave town. Lord. So just yeah, so what's your question? <laughs> <laughs> Is it working? Has it worked in, in this fourth republic? Well, I mean, in many ways, I would look at this question in, in a bifurcatory sense. So, democracy has normative aspects, right? So, questions of rights, individual rights, questions of the institutions to moderate power, uh, the role of the citizen, etc. Right? Now, if you take the Ghanaian case, in my view, to some extent, the normative side, in terms of the institutions, and if you like, checking the boxes, somewhat, I think that we've made some gains. I grew up in the 80s, right? And almost every day, you had rumors of coups and coups, unlawful detentions, you know, murder because of politics, those who held power, Jerry Rawlings, Nobody asked them anything. You had a cabal of people who would decide, for example, on JSS, and they just went ahead, right? Okay, fast forward. 1991, we had the referendum, etc. We've made some transitions. So I acknowledge that transition. But the greatest challenge of that democracy, in terms of the normative part and how it translates into our existence, is the problem solving part. Right? Questions of our daily existence, questions of education, of employment, and the rest of them. In my view, if you take an objective view of, of these questions, then I don't think that the democracy is delivering. You understand? And it is partly because of this seduction with the normative side. We think that we have political parties, we have a parliament, we have a presidency. And so somewhat deterministically or mechanically, you can transition from that normative, if you like, high point to the everyday you know, questions. But we are seeing that the two do not necessarily chime or tie in. And this is the Ghanaian problem going into the decades of this, of this century. How do we find a way to use this system to respond to the problems that we face, right? And especially for the broad masses of our people, right? And, and, and the word elite was mentioned. You see clearly that this democracy is serving those who are connected to power in the bureaucracy, in the political parties, etc., etc. I mean, you have somebody who could hardly buy the most, you know, rickety car. He goes to parliament, and right before your eyes, the guy is riding in a V8, has a mansion. Democracy is expensive. Not in that sense. You know, not, not in that sense. But I get your point. 
right? So uh, there's a sense in which you have all these quirks and these kinks that we need to find a way to smooth in. And that really is the challenge, in my view. Um, Prof, back to you. I think you set the tone for this. Um, um, but, but there's a point, though. Prof, I'll come to you. I need to um, see if I can get Kina and Mami on this point that you made. The prof set the framework within three broad areas. So is our voice being heard? He asked. Are votes counting? Parties really representing us? Elections really free and fair? Um, and is it delivering on the goodies? Is it making our lives better? I think a lot of us have answered that question overwhelmingly, asking it's not delivering on the goodies. But if you look at the other bits that Prof mentioned, is our voice being heard, our, our votes counting, parties really representing, elections being free and fair. Um, that, that would, the, would the conclusions you've come to still be the same? Um, um, Kina, let me start with you. Will your conclusions be the same? Um, yeah. Um. So no, our voice is not, our collective voice isn't being heard. But there is also an issue of um, what the voice says and how many of us are saying it at the same time with all the knowledge that we have. So I have a real big problem with forums like this, even though I'm sitting on one. Because Ghanaian civil society, where I work, is like this. And I was saying in our conversation that if, if this was France, and we had a forum like this, and it was televised all around the, you know, the country, everybody would understand. Would all, you see, so, but if we do this in English, one, it's, it's very restricted in terms of space. Then, and we continue to do this, we've done this over 25 years. So the voice, what, what goes into, the inputs into the voice itself, we are lacking. So it's not just an issue of politicians or our leaders have to listen to us. The quality of what the voice is saying, what the voice wants, what the voice has access to, this is one of our biggest problems because we have fragmented voices based on fragmented kind of in us in inaccessibility to sort of the inputs that make the voice this is what i'm saying because we continue to and the politicians know that um you know we can have this nice conversation here but the politicians know this thing that is happening here is not going to inform the voice in kete Krachi. but they will get into a car and go to kete Krachi. that's what is informing the voice there and if, if people in Katakrashi are saying something and they want something and we don't hear or we don't support them, you know, there's a collect because they speak. They may be NDC, MPP, CBP, whatever, whatever. If they are one voice, so they are actually one. So when, but we are fragmented. We don't engage with each other enough. Uh, heaven forbid we start talking about discourse in English as opposed to our own Ghanaian, you know, you know, Ghanaian middle class for, you know. So we have to find a way in which we are inclusive. And that's a very active, that, that, that's, a, that, that's one of our biggest problems in voice. Yeah, that's an interesting point. Mame, so the non-material aspects of democracy. Right. I think we've talked about material a bit. Yes, exactly. I mean, she says, even that, she has a problem with the voice. Right. Yes. What do you say? What's your conclusion on those aspects as well? Um, I also say, I mean, going back to the voice, um, the element, I mean, she's touched on a lot of things, but I would also say that people has, are only good, as good as the information that they have. And to what extent, you know, when you're speaking is what you're saying that carries weight. And the truth of the matter is that how well are we even informed? I've engaged once even with a minister, I won't mention who, and um, there was some that I thought he should have known because considering the fact that, well, hey, I'm just, I'm a young person, I'm not even in the field, you should know this. And he was very confused. Mm -hmm. Then he said, enlighten me, and I was thinking, oh, wait, but the role you're playing <laughs> is very relevant to the position that you have. How can you not know this? So I even realized that not only are the masses not informed, even the people in power are clueless. So then the thing of the truth of the matter is that how can they even hear your voice whether they themselves don't even know what, is, what the heck is going on, what they're even doing there. And so I'm just realizing that for, even for, for our voice to be heard, what information do we have? How well, what do we even know about this democracy that we are talking about? About things about the WTO. Who, who decides the price of your goods? You're a farmer, you, all you know is government. No, it's deciding the WTO. And WTO will tell you African states contribute zero to jurisprudence. In the sense that we have a bunch of cases in the WTO about our agricultural products and then it's not being heard. That's the reason why this AFCFTA is a big deal for us. 
Look at the law of the sea. Pay attention. I was just talking about it earlier. The EEZ, our exclusive economic zone, some of the laws that govern it. They will tell you, oh, if you cannot, you don't have the capacity to fish to this extent. Foreign states can come. Of course, we don't have the capacity. But to what extent does even the minister of fishery know these basic, basic things? Are there discussions about it? So you realize that um, we, don't even, we don't have enough, enough information. Our leaders are not even well informed. That is why they sign certain agreements and implicate us years down the line and then look confused later, like what the Francophone states are experiencing because of agreements that they signed that have tied their currency to um, France where they have to pay money every year. And, they are, and the next generation is experiencing poverty. And they don't know why. They don't know that somebody years ago signed something that sold your destiny. So how well are we even informed to even speak to bring change? And as she said, so... Uh, Lloyd, surely, oh, sh surely we are voting in free and fair elections. Right. Surely we are re electing our representatives. Right. Surely we've had the most stable democracy in the sub-region right. by a country mile. Surely that aspect of our democracy is working. Yeah, of course. I mean, but it's instrumental. That of itself, you know, should be linked to w in the ways in which that goodness of those things you know translates into 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 our into our in terms of the betterment of our lives but the point i wanted to make in addition to that is this that the, the reality of existence is said that and especially nation building and transformation is said that you never start with everything in place the history of development shows this no country China, Korea, Japan, the U.S., and the rest of them started with everything in place. Homogeneous language, ethnic groups of, of you know, tribal, you know, agglomerations or whatever, engaging with each other in, in a, in a lovey-dovey manner, resources, right? I mean, the Americans and, and, and the West would come here and take slaves and, 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 and enslave people and use that as a basis for their leap forward, right? So, you never really would get everything in place. That then means that you have to navigate. That means you need agents, agency. You need leadership. So what kind of political parties do you have? Do they think through these questions? Or is this grabbing political parties, you know, so they don't care about the law of the sea? They don't understand that Anglo-American power was based on the control of the seas. And today, people are in the Arctic region. And now it's space. Do they talk about these things in the parties? When they open the party offices, what do they do there? Is it Ian Kodum Hausa Koko? Over to you. I, well, I like, I, like, I like where he ended. Yes, we to work for it. I think um, when we say democracy is expensive, uh, usually we mean it in terms of the financial cost of running a democracy. But I think democracy is expensive in the sense in which Lloyd just used the term, work for it. It's about agency, right? So democracy doesn't really, it just gives you a frame. It sets up a certain framework and it gives you uh, certain rights, certain institutions. But how you work with those rights and those institutions to produce an outcome or an output depends on citizen engagement. So democracy itself will not guarantee you any output. It will not guarantee you any outcome. It is just providing you with a medium, some vehicles, some tools, and then expecting that you, the citizen, will activate those tools, those institutions, to produce the outcome that you want. Now that is where it becomes difficult, right? So that is where democracy is expensive. It is not a system for a lazy society. It is not. If, if you just have the system we have, where people, there are parties, uh, they don't do the kind of work that um, uh, parties do that Lloyd is familiar with, they don't um, develop strategic thinking about big issues and all of that. Uh, they wait election time and even that is the campaign of the presidential candidate who actually generates the manifesto. I mean, these are not the kinds of parties we have that are 
developmental of the kind that you know. We've talked about voice. You have voice, but how well are you using it to articulate citizen concerns? The voice is not even entirely your voice. It's mediated voice. It's moderated voice. There's a media that filters through, sets an agenda that might be different from what the citizens themselves want. The media is concentrated in a part of the country, in Accra. Uh, Accra concerns, uh, Adenta roads are usually, you know, uh, the reef, you know, because that's where, you know, the media uh, uh, honchos live uh, or on spin text, you know. So, so if you are in Ketekrachi somewhere and your, your primary school is inaccessible, uh, you have to catch the attention of some media person who goes there and gets inconvenienced actually, for it to become news. So there are all these things. I, I concede, right? So when it comes to voice, the voice, how is the voice expressed? What are the channels that the voice? So we have to really look at all of these things. Who owns media outlets, increasingly politicians, right? The idea of media in democracy was not, when you read, there's something interesting about the Constitution, when you read the part on the media, it, there's a very interesting term that the media, um, it, it, it talks in terms of media uh, being, holding the government responsible, right? right? So the, the idea of a media is a trustee for the people. It is not supposed to be on the side of the political class. It's actually a vehicle that people are supposed to use to hold government to account. But increasingly, the media belongs to the political class. How is it going to hold them to account? So these are some of the gaps and the deficits and the departures from the norm, the departures from the theory that I think we should engage, right? So absolutely nobody uh, is, is, is suggesting that democracy itself, in and of itself, will produce those goods, right? It requires agency. It requires active, continuous. Not once every four years you go and vote. No democracy that relies on that kind of citizen engagement will ever produce anything but a government of politicians for politicians by politicians, right? If you want democracy to be a government of, by, for the people, the people must be continuously, on a daily basis, engaged in all of these institutions we've talked about, in voice, in votes, in parties, in elections, in how elections work, in all of these things. And for me, the real issue is we know that that's not working. What, has, what accounts for that? Why have our parties become the kind of party that Lloyd is lamenting? Because for better, I mean, no matter how we feel about democracy, I think we are locked into a multi-party democracy. That's the choice we've made. It appears, I don't see anything on the horizon that's going to about the choice. And for me, you see that there is anything fundamentally, inherently, normatively wrong, right? So sometimes when I debate uh, Lloyd, I say, well, democracy itself is not the problem. It's democracy with Ghanaian characteristics, right? And I like to mock him because uh, uh, he, he's, uh, <laughs> he says it's democracy with Western characteristics. I said, no, 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 no. What we have is democracy with Ghanaian characteristics, right? And some of the Ghanaian characteristics I can enumerate, right? Uh, the kinds of parties we have, yeah, you can find them in the West, too. I agree. I agree with you, right? The parties that don't quite represent people, that don't quite aggregate people's interests and preferences, but that are beholden to the money bags. Absolutely, right? So the question for us is, how do we get the kind of party that is not beholden to the money bag? Where, if you were a reformer today, let's say you are a radical reformer, you really want to make change. Which of the parties that we have now could you actually navigate to the top? Almost neither. I mean, none of them. Well, I don't want to restrict ourselves to two parties. But I, I think if you are hugely reform-minded, radical, you want to really make a big turnaround in the system, you will be hard-pressed to find a party that you can actually navigate all the way to become the candidate who gets elected and makes change. By the first round of the primaries, you are out. You are out because you're not going to do yourself, I'm so principled and I'm not going to buy any delegates. You are out. Right? So the, the challenge for us is all of these things that we agree are, are just almost value-neutral institutions in and of themselves. You know, the votes, 
the voice, all of these things, what has made them not workable in our context? Why is voice not for us? Why is the vote not working for us? Why are elections not working for us? Why are parties not working for us? That's the kind of conversation I think we should engage in because it shifts the burden back onto us. It shifts the burden. It's expensive. And we think it has to be cheap. There's no system in which the agent, once you have picked the agent, right? So democracy is based on just simple principal agent relationship. The principal picks an agent, so the agent will go and work for the principal. And the principal has to stay on the agent's neck. There is a monitoring cost to agency. When you pick an agent, you should be suspicious. The agent can engage in self-dealing. Most agents do. So the principal has to stay back, but has to find various ways of making sure the agent stays in check and does things for the principal. If you don't do that, any agent will start to do self-dealing. They will start to use the agency you've given them, the power you've given them, to take care of themselves first and foremost, and sometimes even last. First and last. They take care of themselves, and your needs are never met. That's the kind of democracy we seem to be producing, but it doesn't have to be so. So the question is, what is our role as civil society, as citizens? How have we managed to get ourselves locked out of the system that we ourselves are supposed to have created for ourselves? I hope you enjoyed this episode of our two-part discussion on making democracy work for the people. For the concluding part of this illuminating conversation, join us next week. This has been the Ghana Conversations podcast with me, Teresa Anda. For more engaging and thought-provoking content, visit our website, www.cddgh.org, and be sure to tune in to the next episode. <laughs>